Pleasure to be back with you. I was uh, just checking this morning, uh, beginning of August, since we've been here last. Uh, you were anticipating Stephen coming at the end of the month and Pastor Paul being completed his time of uh, transitional ministry here. And uh, So it's nice to be here. Nice to meet Stephen finally in person and uh, look forward to meeting his wife and their family at some point as well. And we do wish them uh, well with this new arrival that everything would go uh, safely and a healthy baby would join their family. Well, the theory, uh, the theme this morning for the Advent candle is hope. And uh, hope is a, an interesting thing. Uh, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary and defines it like this, and I, I like this definition. There's all sorts of, of other ones that you could find. But it says to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or to be true. To cherish or desire with a desire with anticipation. That's what people uh, hoped for in the Old Testament, as uh, Stephen read for us this morning from Isaiah. Uh, they were anticipating with great desire a coming Savior, a Savior who would set them free from the tyranny of other nations around them that they often found themselves under their rule and so on. And you know, today in our world, people hope for all sorts of things. We hope for all sorts of things. And some of those things are great things, and some of them are just small and trivial things. Uh, think about some of the things you hope for. Uh, some of you might be sports fans, and you have a particular team that you hope wins and does well. And sometimes those hopes are fulfilled, and sometimes they are dashed, aren't they? Uh, we hope for our families to be healthy and whole and and to make good choices. Um, those of us who are parents and our, our children uh, get married, we hope for grandbabies, you know, and all those kinds of things. Uh, those are all good hopes. Uh, we hope uh, sometimes, uh, I, on a day like today, I hope we don't have any more of these kind of days, uh, but I, I kind of know that that's a hope that's going to get dashed too. Uh, welcome to Alberta, by the way, Stephen. I don't, what, what were you guys thinking? No, it's great. The people are great. They'll make up for all of the winter. Uh, but hope is something that really uh, we, we all have. And yet there are many people in our world today uh, that are hopeless. Uh, they live in a world where their hopes have been dashed and where things aren't going well for them. And life is not all that exciting. And so we live in a world that, for many people, uh, need hope, a hope that we have that we can share with them. And so I want to look at three facets of hope this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 8. We're going to begin there, but I'll be kind of dashing all over the place this morning. But the point, uh, the first point I want to make this morning is that hope is about something which is yet to come. Uh, hope is some, about something which is yet to come. I'm going to read a passage, this passage from Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 18. And, and Paul, in this passage, is uh, talking about suffering. And you know, often in Scripture, I find that hope is related to that topic of suffering. And that's a topic that many of us here really know very little about because the suffering that they were facing was one of, of persecution, uh, which, again, for our world, <laughs> uh, it isn't really a, a big deal. But listen to what Paul says. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the paths pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves are the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoptions as sons and the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, 
We wait for it patiently. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Who hopes for what he already has? Uh, Paul asks. And you know, we uh, often, as I said earlier, what we hope for is in the future. And yet we think, well, but we already have salvation. Jesus has already come and he's died for us. And we who believe have been promised that we have the gift of salvation. And that is true. But Paul wants to make the, the, the point that what we have uh, now is not all that there is yet for us to receive. Uh, you know, these Old Testament prophets spoke of a hope that was coming. They spoke of the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, the Almighty God, uh, who would bring salvation and peace. And we sang that and we heard it read this morning. When Jesus was born, the angels declared, We bring good news that will be of great joy for all people. For today in the city of David, a Savior has been born who is Christ the Lord. And then they talked about glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace on those on whom God's favor rests. And yet we look and we think, but did they get that wrong? I mean, when we look around our world, there isn't much in the line of peace or not at least lasting peace in terms of relationships between nation and nation, between uh, countries and, and, and people groups. Even in our own uh, nation, there is you know, discord on how things should be done and blah, 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 and, and political discord and all those kinds of things. And it even comes down to our own families and our own relationships where sometimes peace does not reign supreme in our homes or in our marriages or in our families. And we think, well, did they get it wrong? No. The problem was that what the, the prophets were proclaiming and what the angels proclaimed was a both a, a here and now and a yet to be fully fulfilled kind of announcement. You see, the prophets were predicting that, yes, a Savior would be born, and that, that was fulfilled that night in Bethlehem. Jesus was born. He is the Savior of the world. The problem is, uh, it was a different salvation that he was bringing here and now at that point. Uh, his life, as he lived it out perfectly and went to the cross on our behalf, was to bring peace between us and God. But as Stephen talked about and has been talking about, it sounds like one day he is coming back and that peace will be permanent. There will be peace. He will bring peace and righteousness and judgment and that will be fully fulfilled at that time. That hope was a, a both now and yet to come fulfillment uh, that started 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. But for even for those of us who are, have come to faith in Jesus Christ, there is a both a now a fulfillment of salvation, our sins have been forgiven, we've been given the gift of eternal life, but there is more to come as well. well uh, Paul is talking here about the fact that we eagerly await for the redemption of our bodies. And in 1 Corinthians, he wrote this. He says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all. Because it isn't just about this life. It isn't just about the here and now. Uh, Paul uh, was reminding the, his readers, and he reminds us, that when Jesus gave us new life, that new life was for all of eternity. And although we will perish in this world, our bodies will die and they will decay and all of those kinds of things unless Christ should come in the meantime before we die, uh, there is a resurrection to look forward to and that is the blessed hope that Paul is referring to here. That is the yet to come part of our salvation. Our salvation is, is genuine and it's effective for us here and now and it, it, it brings peace between ourselves and God. But we recognize that in the world around us, we still live in a fallen and broken, very broken world. And there are many people who do not have this hope yet within them. This hope that is for us for right now, that our sins are forgiven, and that's a given. Uh, the Bible makes that clear. And in my second point, I'm going to talk about that some more. But there is a hope of something more to come. 
even when we leave this world, uh, we are guaranteed uh, a resurrection and we will spend the eternity in the presence of God where there will be no more pain or suffering or sorrow or tears or unrest or brokenness. And all will be made right. Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 1 that in fact we've been given the Holy Spirit as a deposit, a guarantee of that truth and of that fact that there is more yet to come because of what Jesus has done for us. So there is a yet to come aspect to the hope which we have. Secondly, hope is something that must be placed in the right place or person. Hope must be placed in the right place, in the right person in this case of Jesus. You see, we can hope for all sorts of things, as I mentioned earlier. We can hope, you know, that the weather will be nicer all the time. We can hope for all sorts of things, uh, you know, and, and our, our hope might be very genuine. Um, in fact, we might even call it a faith. It, we can have faith in all sorts of things, but if that faith is not placed in the right place, it, it's going to fail us. You know, you can look at a, a, a pond that's just been freshly frozen and has very thin ice, and you can say, I believe that ice will, will carry my weight as I, and I can walk safely to the other side. Uh, that hope, that faith is likely going to be dashed, especially if you're as heavy as I am. You know, you're going to go through that ice. Uh, we can place our hope and our faith in ourselves. Uh, we can think that we, you know, if we just live our lives very well if we just do enough good things more good things than bad things you know when the when 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 our time is up god will say well this was a good person look at the scales the the good outweighs the bad it doesn't work that way god's standard of holiness is perfection and all of us the bible says have sinned and have gone astray and turned to our own way we just don't measure up we can't measure up we can't earn our own salvation. Uh, Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Paul says this, he reminds us, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven, or under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There is only one place that we can place our hope, our faith in, in order to receive salvation. And that is in the person of Jesus Christ. No other name, not our name, not the name of our pastor, not the name of our church, no other name than the name of Jesus can bring salvation. And it's when, when the Bible talks about the name, they're talking about the person and what they represent and what they have done. And the name of Jesus represents the fact that he is the Son of God, sent by God to bear our sins, our punishment, in order that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And it is only in him that our hope can be placed. But when our hope is placed in him, when our faith is placed in him, this is not a wishful thinking kind of hope, like my wishing, hoping that there's no more of this this winter. That's a wishful thinking kind of hope that likely isn't going to come true. It could come true. There's been the odd occasional winter here <laughs> that's been nice, but very unlikely. But the hope that we have in Jesus is a sure promise because it rests on the truth and the promise of God. Hebrews reminds us, we have this hope as an anchor for our souls. Uh, this truth that when we have put our trust in Jesus, it's a sure hope, a hope we can take to the bank. And that, even that in and of itself, banks sometimes fail. But God never fails, and his promises never fails. When our hope is placed in the right place, it makes all the difference in the world. And even in the midst, then, of the trials and so on that we might face in this world, when we have this hope, it carries us. It anchors our souls to the fact that 
as Paul says, it doesn't really matter what's happening around us in our world. We have this hope as an anchor that keeps our souls steadfast and sure while the billows roll, as the song goes. Uh, when our hope is built on Jesus Christ, on Jesus' blood and righteousness, uh, nothing else matters, as that song goes. Uh, that is the only place where our hope is sure and secure. So our hope must be placed in the right place, and in this case, it is only in the person of Jesus Christ for the gift of salvation, eternal life, and eternity in his presence. So our hope is still something yet to come because while we have been saved, uh, we are yet still in this world and there are still difficulties and there are still trials and there are still tribulations. But one day we will be in his presence. We will be resurrected and have resurrected bodies that no longer have stiff hands from arthritis or whatever ailments we have. You see, sometimes we, we think that when we come to, to Christ, uh, all of our problems will be removed somehow, and there is that kind of a prosperity, health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that says, you know, it's, it's all about me and, and fixing and making my life. No, no, that's a, that's a focus on the here and now. And Paul wants to remind us that in the here and now, there might still be problems, but they're not worth worrying about when we consider the what is yet to come aspect of salvation. Third aspect of hope that I want us to consider this morning is that hope is something that should be visible in us and make a difference in how we live and act in our lives. Hope is something that should be visible in us and make a difference in how we live and act. I want to read a, a passage from 1 Peter this morning. It's probably one that most of you no, Peter, Peter says this, uh, he's talking again, uh, interestingly enough, about suffering and, and being persecuted and all of us. And I'm not going to read the whole passage, but I'm going to begin in verse 13 of chapter 3 of 1 Peter. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. He's talking about the people in the world. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. In that statement, there's an assumption. Two assumptions, really. First of all, that we have this hope of Christ and of eternity and being in his presence. And second of all, that others will see it and it will be so winsome to them, they'll want to know why it is that we have this hope. They should be able to see that there's something different about us because of the hope that we have. In the way that we live out our lives, in the way that... We handle the difficulties that life throws at us. And, and Jesus himself told us that in this world we would have trouble. So it isn't a fact of, of that we won't have any problems. And certainly the, the Christians in the early church, they had problems. Uh, they were persecuted. Uh, they were outcasts in, in many ways. Some of them... Uh, you know, lost their jobs and they were outcast from their families and all of those kinds of things. So they had problems. They knew about problems. They knew about suffering. And yet, both Paul and Peter write very clearly that because of this hope that we have, that shouldn't be affecting where our hope is and how our outlook on life is. In fact, Peter says, be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. That's important. But the second part of his statement is also important to us. And sometimes we just leave this one off. Uh, just saying, you know, be, be prepared to give an answer. And we take that, well, just tell people that, you know, my hope is because I, I'm a sinner saved by grace and you're not, so you're going to hell. And so, you know, you need to 
deal with that. No, listen, listen what it says here. Give, be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it, it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He, has been, he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. I need to get my glasses changed. I already had an appointment. But anyway, <laughs> having a little trouble reading here this morning. Do this with gentleness and respect. Our lives should be increasingly characterized by the life of Christ. We should be being changed more and more into his image and into his likeness. The Bible tells us that, and we could, we could look at that. And there should be a visible evidence in our lives as we live out amongst our neighbors, our co-workers, our classmates, our families. Between, uh, as we live out our lives before those who have not yet put their faith, their hope, in the name of Jesus. And they should see within us uh, that there, there is a difference. It, it doesn't mean that we won't have troubles, and it doesn't mean that you know, our families won't have issues, and it doesn't mean that everything will always go well for us. But it should mean that we respond to those things with still this element of hope, of trust, of peace. Because the angels did proclaim that on the night Jesus was born, there would be peace on those on whom his favor rests. And while this news was good news for everyone, it is especially true for those who receive his peace, who receive the grace that he has poured out to us. As we come to Christmas, you know, especially children, they'll be hoping that, you know, uh, there are some wonderful gifts under the tree for them this year. And just suppose, for instance, that I was to give each of you a nicely wrapped gift that my wife wrapped, or otherwise it wouldn't be nicely wrapped if I did it. But. And, and I presented to you this gift and said, this gift is for you because I care about you. I love you, and so on. And you said, well, thank you, but no thanks. I, I don't want your gift. That gift wouldn't have really any value to you, and you wouldn't be able to open it up and enjoy it, and use it, and experience it. And the same is true of the gift of grace, of salvation, of peace that God offers to each individual. Unless they actually accept it and invite it to be a part of their life, there is no peace between them and God. But when we do, when we receive that gift, and when our sin is forgiven and are we given the gift of new life, Jesus said, I leave you my peace, peace that passes all hum human understanding, not as the world gives. And our lives should be evidenced by that peace, that peace between ourselves and God. And that peace is not affected by the world around us. This world is troubled, and it is not at peace. But our hearts, our hearts should be at peace because of what God has done for us and because of what we know is yet to come, that Jesus will return, that there will be peace, that there will be uh, righteousness and justice and all of those things, and that we will spend eternity in God's presence. So our lives should be evidenced by this hope. Our lives should be so winsome to those around us that they want to ask, why is it that when you face troubles or tribulations or sickness or you know, relational problems, there's still something different about you? Why is it that you're more optimistic about the future? Why is it you don't seem to complain about all that's going on? And you know, 
I, I have to confess, it's very easy for us to get sucked into what the world fears and what the world believes and, and all of those things. And, and we can become a part of that. And, and, you know, we need to be so careful about how we respond and what we say and how we live our lives and how we act out in front of us. Because we are being watched. We are being watched. And if people aren't seeing with us in us an evidence of a changed life, a transformed life because of what Christ has done for us, then we need to ask ourselves, <laughs> where is my hope? What is my hope in? Um, and do I really hope in the, the government of today and you know all that goes on around me? Or is my hope placed somewhere where it is more secure? Where it is fixed and regardless of what happens in this world, my life, my future is secure. I pray that more and more that would be the, the case for us. That our hope would be focused on the one to come, on what is yet to come. And, and I have a question for you this morning. I was going to ask this at the beginning, but I, I forgot. I'm going to ask it anyway. How many of you spend a lot of time thinking about what is yet to come? Thinking about heaven. Uh, you know, I, I have a theory that we tend to not think about it very much here in this world because we have it pretty good <laughs> in this part of the world. But as I was preparing this and I made the connection that hope in the Bible is almost always connected to suffering, uh, it, it rang true to me uh, that when our world is not so great, we tend to think about heavenly things and future things. Um, many of the slaves of the southern United States wrote many songs about heaven, about Beulah land, about all those things, because they thought about that, because life on earth for them was hell. But life on earth for us is not so much that way. Uh, we still complain a lot because we live in a very uh, culture that is, feels very entitled. <laughs> And we think that everything should be perfect and we shouldn't have any problems and so on and so forth. But that world is yet to come. We're not yet there. The world still is groaning because of the fall, anticipating that day. And that hope should be within us. And that should be a hope that people can see in us and want to know why it is that we have that hope. And that's when we need to be able to respond and say, you know what, my hope is built on Jesus Christ and nothing else. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the hope that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that all who hope in him, who believe in him, will not perish but have everlasting life. And I pray that for each one of us who has come to that place already, that Christ in us, the hope of glory, as Paul wrote to the Colossians, might become more and more and more evident. That people would see a difference in us because of the hope that we have and be drawn to you through us. And may we respond in grace and respect and in love to those who inquire about the hope that we have. May that hope increase in us and may it become more visible to others, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.